For me, it's easy to imagine the 50 to 60 people that lived in a semi-permanent Ice Age village debating among themselves about how to feed and clothe their growing population. Being completely human, lasting disagreements sometimes occurred in those tight-knit communities. No doubt a few disgruntled villagers would, from time to time, strap on their animal hide shoes, pick up their flint spears, and leave the area in search of new hunting and gathering grounds. Others who chose to stay behind no doubt benefited from less competition for the wild edibles that kept them alive. Even today, when the economy of an area becomes strapped, local people must decide either to migrate or stay and make changes in their culture and social relationships. Overcrowded situations like those force people to depend on technology and complex social and economic systems to pack themselves into places first settled by our ancestors 13 to 15,000 years ago. During the last ice age, which is where we would find ourselves if we could travel back in time 13 to 15,000 years, restricted growing seasons and fewer prey species to hunt made being close to flowing water even more important than it is today. That's where life could best be sustained. This begs the question, did the earliest migrants or immigrants to the Americas walk on frozen ground across a land bridge or did they travel by boat? I'm certainly not the first person to ask that question. In 1947, Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl tested the theory that the earliest Americans came by boat across 8,000 miles of Pacific Ocean. His Kon-Tiki expedition showed that, there, that it was possible to make an 8,000 mile cross of the Pacific in a handmade primitive boat. While I greatly respect Heyerdahl's accomplishment, I'm proposing to you a logical and geographical scientific approach that suggests that boats could have been used to make it to the Americas from Asia in a much more efficient, though lengthier manner than traversing thousands of miles of open ocean. Could the same method explain why a flourishing Peruvian civilization predated the Greek and Roman societies? Today on The Vantage Point, we're going to explore an intriguing theory that stresses the use of boats and ocean currents in the early settlement of the Americas. I hope you'll join me. The earliest civilizations were established in Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus River Valley, Peru, China, and Central Asia. It's amazing that these places, separated by thousands of miles of land and or sea, came into existence within a thousand years or so of each other. Despite being the home of humans for more than 12,000 years or so since the end of the Pleistocene, no large European society is as old as these proto-civilizations. Perhaps Europe during the Pleistocene was just too cold to invite immigrants. On the other hand, Lands newly exposed by retreating glaciers likely provided them with resources sufficient to maintain hunting and gathering lifestyles, while keeping the impetus for the formation of a civilization to a minimum. There appears to be a high but inverse spatial correlation between these places, these early civilizations, in terms of time and distance from the Near East. Peru, however, is obviously further away from the Near East than China or Central Asia, but it's an older civilization than its Asian counterparts. Indeed, debate rages over the dates of wood artifacts found in Monteverde in northern Chile and paint specks found in earthen layers believed to be 17,000 years old at Pedro Ferrada in Brazil. However, genetic evidence and ocean currents provide evidence of a less controversial explanation for Ice Age settlements in the Americas. About 40,000 years ago, hunters and gatherers spread out from the Near East and traversed the Asian and European land masses. They built semi-permanent villages on the coasts in Eastern China and Western Europe at nearly the same time, about 7,000 BC, which interestingly enough is the approximate time in which the first Peruvian villages were established. Asians and Europeans, which were identities obviously that the hunters and gatherers did not use, developed modest boat technology, but unlike Europeans, Asians were able to hunt and fish in the kelp beds that stretched along the Pacific coast. Their tasks were made somewhat easier by being able to float on the Carisio current that flowed north along the Asian coastline. In a rather short period of time, perhaps a few generations, those who traveled north along the Asian shore 
found the Aleutian Islands, and over time, they followed them into the Americas. This movement was uh, aided by the Coriolis effect, which, cause, which causes a clockwise circulation of water in the northern uh, uh, oceans. Along the west coast of North America, the southward flowing function of this ocean current is called the California Current. These ocean currents are really powerful. Consider this supporting factoid. A motorcycle owned by a Japanese man was lost during the March 2011 tsunami that inundated the coastal areas of northeastern Japan. Just a year later, in April 2012, the motorcycle was found on the shore of Graham Island in British Columbia. That's in western Canada. While ocean currents theoretically aided Asian migration to the Americas, they were an obstacle to Europeans who may have wanted to cross the Atlantic. With offshore currents flowing toward the east and Europe, and then south along the European coast, the North Atlantic impeded Europeans from, sail, from setting sail or even rowing to North America. It would have been no easy feat to use the technology available before the 9th century to attempt such a journey. It probably was pretty challenging even then. Because of its extreme distance from the Near East, Peruvian settlement is another matter and one that deserves further geographic and biological analysis. Stay tuned. With an understanding of ocean currents, it's not too difficult to imagine what conditions encouraged the first humans to settle in the area today known as Peru. Their arrival was about the same time as the permanent residents who settled in Great Britain. Under the influence of Coriolis, ocean currents, as I mentioned a minute or so ago, circulate clockwise in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans north of the equator, but they circulate counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. This means that migrants likely rode the ocean currents that steadily increased in temperature as they approached Mesoamerica, that's Central America, and then South America. Ecuador and Northern Peru sit close to the equator, and it's in this general area that the currents bend westward across the Pacific. Traveling on a short distance further south beyond the equator, the increasingly colder ocean currents that were then flowing northward were of little use as a transportation medium. Perhaps hoping to find warmer waters again, they may have followed the coastline a little further south, fighting northbound currents along the way. Now, instead of locating temperate rich waters, they found increasingly colder currents flowing up from what we know of as Antarctica. This flow of water today is also called the Humboldt Current, and the thirsty Anacama Desert forms along its shore in Chile. For the early settlers to travel further south, they would have had to struggle against a desert environment. Logic suggests that they would have turned back north, and had they traveled on toward Mesoamerica, they would have been running headfirst into the southward flowing California current. Rivers and streams drain the well-watered Andean uplands, the mountains. The higher elevations of the Andes offer relief from the warmer temperatures that persisted in low-lying and coastal areas. After all, this is near the equator. Some 8,000 feet above sea level must have been a natural utopia. The early rise of civilization there would certainly suggest that its builders thought it was an ideal place to live. My geographic theory on the use of ocean currents in coastal waters is supported by mitochondrial DNA identified among Native Americans living in Central and South America. Of the four main maternal clans to leave Asia and arrive in the Americas, one of them is not commonly found among residents of Siberia and Mongolia. There's nothing specific in Siberian or Mongolian DNA to suggest that their ancestors could not have taken to the sea in search of flowing waters and wild edibles, or even cross a land bridge. The non-Mongolian and non-Siberian DNA found in the Americas is quite similar to Polynesians who originated in the coastal areas of Southeast Asia. The slight changes in their DNA suggest rather strongly that older relatives of modern Polynesians took part in seagoing adventures that transformed them into Native Americans about 13,000 years ago. In the final analysis, analysis, it's nearly impossible to prove that ocean currents brought the earliest settlers to the Americas, but I think it is a theory that makes sense 
a lot more sense than people from Southeast Asia or Mongolia walking to South America. Well, I hope you got something out of today's show. And if you did, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Take care of you and yours, and I'll see you next time on The Vantage Point.